Good to be here with you guys tonight. I want to take a moment just to welcome everyone that's joining us online and uh, really would encourage you to be engaged with the teaching tonight. If you're here in the room, I would encourage you to be taking notes. It's just a good way to go back and look at some of these things later. I may not be able to share a whole lot of significant things tonight other than the Word of God, but uh, there might be a thing or two that stand out that you might want to go and look up later on. I would encourage you, if you're joining us online, to uh, take some screenshots of different slides that we'll share. Go and grab a pad of paper yourself and uh, give you a minute to, to do that. And as you do that, just want to welcome uh, my friend Ryan that's joining us online in Herman. Shout out to my, uh, to my friend. And uh, as well as all of my small group members that are joining online, shout out to you guys. And would you do me a favor? If you're joining us online in the, uh, in the chat box area, just let us know what town uh, you're living in. And if you're watching from out of state, let us know what state you're watching uh, and joining us online from here tonight. I'm so blessed to be able to be with you all. I love our church. Do you love our church? I love our pastor. You guys love our pastor, Pastor Kirk, and more, most importantly, I love Jesus, and uh, I am blessed to be able to be here and do um, what he's called me to do to see his church grow. I want to give you a quick update on something here that's happened this past week. Do you know that we, we worship a miracle-working God? Do you know that we worship a powerful God? Well, this past week, uh, actually last week, Pastor Jay stood here on this very stage, and he declared to each and every single one of us and before God that he had a desire of his heart, and he had a, a prayer that he brought before God constantly to have an afro that wouldn't fit through, this, through, through a door. And I just want to give you guys a good report tonight of a miracle that God has performed. God did it. He did it. God is an awesome God, and he does amazing things. Just take that in for a moment. Oh, it's too, too good. Someone take a picture and show that to Jay later. Um, but in all seriousness, Pastor Jay uh, had a uh, great uh, sermon that he brought to us last week talking about who we are in Christ that we are forgiven, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are blessed of the Lord, we are Christians united as, in Christ as one body, and we are called to make a difference. We're called to make a difference. This is who we are in Christ. And he talked about some of these things to help us realize our identity in Christ. Jesus. And tonight, we're going to be going through the uh, 12th chapter of the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 12 uh, with me. And chapter 12 is a hinge chapter here within the book of Acts. There, there is a transition that is about to take place. And this is a significant moment within the book. I love the 12th chapter of the book of Acts for a few different reasons. There is some significant things that are, are, are about to unfold. And you really can divide the book of Acts into two halves. There's the first half and the second half. And the transition point between those two halves in the book of Acts is chapter 12. Where this transition Happens, and, and I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation as we go throughout Scripture tonight. So let's go ahead and begin reading verse 1 of chapter 12. It says this, About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some of the believers in the church. He began to persecute some of the believers in the church. Now, I want us to understand a little bit better about who this King Herod Agrippa is. I don't know if you know this. I didn't know this as I was digging into chapter 12. There are actually four Herods that ruled. Did you know that? There, there are uh, a family of Herods, and the Bible records 
four different King Herods within the same family at different times. So I have a little graph here, a little chart. You, you could say kind of like a family tree. It started at the top. The patriarch of the Herod reigning and ruling family was Herod the Great. And we see Herod the Great show up uh, during the time of Jesus' birth. He was the one that had all of the uh, baby boys murdered in uh, Bethlehem that were right around the age of two or under because that's uh, the expectation of the age that Jesus was and Herod was trying to ultimately kill this baby Messiah that was born that he heard about. So he killed all of the kids just to be safe. So he was the one that kind of kicked things off. And then there was Herod Antipas. He was the next one that ruled within this family. He was the one that was involved in Jesus' trials and John the Baptist's execution. And then it skips over from Herod Antipas to Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa's father was Aristobulus. He, he didn't rule and reign. Uh, it, it went to Agrippa's uncle, and then after Antipas, it came down to Herod Agrippa I. His middle name was actually Julius. So some places you might see Herod Julius Agrippa. Some places you might just see him referred to as Agrippa I. And this is the guy that we're reading about in Acts chapter 12. And Herod Agrippa I, as we're about to read here within chapter 12, murdered the apostle James and imprisoned Peter. Now, an interesting kind of family connection with Herod Agrippa I is Herodias was Agrippa's sister. So if you remember when John the Baptist was speaking out uh, against Herodias, Herodias had a daughter named Herodias, which was Agrippa's sister. So when um, John the Baptist was murdered, it was because of his sister's provocative dancing that led to her making the appeal to Antipas to have John the Baptist beheaded and killed. And then after Agrippa I was his son, Agrippa II, and he's the one that was one of Paul's judges, and we're going to see him come onto the scene in Acts chapter 25 and Acts chapter 26. So here down the road, as we get further along in the book of Acts, we're going to read about a King Herod Agrippa again, and that is going to be Agrippa II, Agrippa I's son. Now, for good or for evil, we are able to see a lasting and powerful influence within a family on their children and future generations. You can almost look right down a family tree and you can see some uh, common threads, some common themes that pop up time and time and time again. Reoccurring character traits, reoccurring character flaws, hobbies, employment, priorities, addiction, divorce. You can look up and down a family tree, and oftentimes you'll see kind of these recurring themes, these threads of, of similarity that are popping up. And this is why it's so important for us to be training our kids in the way of the Lord, living out an authentic faith before them, because we want that to be a positive impact, a positive difference that we're passing on to our kids. We, we need to be walking out Deuteronomy chapter 6, ta telling our kids about the Lord, about his word, about how we're to live, living out an authentic faith before them. Now, unfortunately, that was not the case with the Herods. The Herod family had built a reputation of unjustified violence. And though none of these other Herods, Antipas or, or the Agrippas, they never attained the kind of brutality that Herod the Great did, potentially because Rome by that point, by the time that Antipas and the Agrippas were reigning, Rome had got a firmer grip of uh, ruling and control in the whole region, so there probably wasn't as much of a need for them to be as heavy-handed and brutal as Herod the Great was. 
Now, as we read verse 1, I, I want us to ask this question. Why was Agrippa the first persecuting the church? We kick off chapter 12, and we read about how Agrippa is persecuting the church. Why was he persecuting the church? Persecuting the church really was a win-win situation for Agrippa. On one hand, he was able to show the Roman Empire that he was able to control any kind of um, dangerous movement that was happening right in front of him in his domain. On the other hand, he was able to show the Jewish leaders and the people that he was willing to stand up for their religious tradition and the things that they held near and dear to their hearts. And we're going to read about one of those such persecutions as we read into verse 2. Verse 2 says this, He, he being Herod Agrippa I, had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. The apostle James, John's brother. This is James, son of Zebedee. This is James, one of the sons of of thunder. Now, we learned about this very same uh, family back in J- uh, on January 31st when we learned about James and John when we went through the Selfless series, and we talked about selfless serving on January 31st. We read about James and John, the sons of thunder. James and John, in that sermon, we talked about how they chose a path of self promotion, not self-denial, where they were promoting themselves and they were trying to get a seat of honor as Jesus uh, is about to leave this earth and he's about to go into the eternal kingdom. And they come up to him and they say, can, can one of us sit at your right hand and the other one at your left hand in seats of honor in eternity? Jesus asked them, can you drink from the cup that I'm about to drink Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? When he's asking them these questions, he's inferring persecution to them. Can you be persecuted as I am persecuted? And their response was, yeah, (laughs) we, we can do that. And Jesus went on to say that they indeed would drink from the cup that he was about to drink and be baptized with the baptism of suffering that he was about to be baptized with, we see Jesus' response there to them in Mark chapter 10, verse 39. Now, James, one of Jesus' inner circle, James was one of the three that was the closest to Jesus, is murdered. He dies a martyr's death. Now, James, his brother, all of the apostles, when, when Jesus was taken away to stand trial, they all fled away from him initially. But Jesus, in Mark 10, 39, said, you will drink from that cup. And we see here in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, he finally did. Now, interestingly, James is the only apostle whose martyrdom is recorded in the New Testament. There's no other apostle. There's none, none of the other 12 were told about in Scripture about how they were martyred other than James. Now, we heard about it earlier in the book of Acts about a guy named Stephen who was martyred. He was, he was stoned to death. He wasn't one of the original 12. He was just one of Christ's disciples. Let's continue to read here in verse 3. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, the Jewish people were pleased when Herod had James killed with the sword. When he saw how much that pleased him, he went on and arrested Peter as well. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him. Verse 4, placing him under the guard of four squads of of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. Now, Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and Luke tells us twice 
here within these two verses that all of this was taking place during Passover. Now, we don't know how many years have passed since the Passover with Christ at the Last Supper, because we know that Jesus was crucified during Passover as well. That's one of the reasons they went and were breaking the bones of um, the convicts that were crucified next to Christ was to speed up their death because Passover was just about to uh, be in, in full swing. We don't know how many years have passed since the Passover with Christ at the Last Supper until this point, but we do know that Passover is a time when the people of Israel celebrate God's delivering them from slavery. Now, on this Passover, we're going to see how one leader was delivered, and we're going to see how one leader was not. Verse 5, but while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly. Some translations say they were constantly praying. So this was not a casual kind of prayer. This was a, a kind of prayer that they were, they were pressing in. They were fervently praying. They were constantly praying. They were very earnestly, constantly praying for Peter. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial. Talk about coming through at the last moment. Peter's in prison the night before he's about to stand trial. What do you think is, is waiting uh, for Peter the next morning? He, he's about to get killed, just like James was. And, and he knows what, what's at, at stake. Can you imagine the, the things that are going through Peter's mind? But the church was earnestly praying for him. He was asleep, fastened with two chains between two, two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to, to wake him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now, put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, followed by the angel. But all the time, he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize that it was actually happening. Now, Peter had previously had a vision from God. You remember back in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes up onto a rooftop to, to pray, and he falls into a trance, and he gets this vision from God. And so Peter thinks that this is happening again. He thinks all of this is just, it's a dream, it's a vision. But this was no vision. Reality is about to set in for Peter in two short verses. Verse 10, they passed the first and the second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally comes to his senses. So all the way up to this point, he just thinks it's a vision. He finally comes to, the, to his senses. It's really true. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from the Jewish leaders from what they had planned to do to me. Peter is saved. Peter is rescued. Peter is spared. But why wasn't James? Why was Peter saved, but James wasn't? Life is full of hard questions just like that. And maybe you've asked some similar questions like that yourself. Why are they able to get pregnant, but I can't? Why did they get healed of cancer, but my loved one or I didn't? Why are their kids totally fine when my kids have these mental and physical disabilities? Why are they so well off financially, 
and we're struggling? Why does everyone else have beautiful vehicles and I'm stuck driving this stupid beater? Why is their spouse so loving and caring and thoughtful and my spouse went and cheated on me and destroyed our family? Why did my child die? And so many other families get to enjoy life with their whole family. We can't answer those kind of questions in life because we don't see everything that God sees. We live in a fallen, sinful world. And we need to remember that God never designed the world and our lives to be like that. All of the results of pain and death that we experience is a part of the fallen world, the fallen nature. It's a result of sin. And God has chosen to allow evil in this world for a time, but thank God there is coming a day when he's going to destroy all evil and he's going to destroy all effects of evil that we see. Amen? We can trust God's leading. We can trust his sovereignty. And God will help use our suffering to strengthen us and to glorify him. I also want us to, as we're looking at this, this very question, I want us to contrast Nehemiah with Peter. Nehemiah does not get any kind of miraculous deliverance. He doesn't get any kind of mighty displays of power. He doesn't get any angels in the night. He just gets a risky assignment and a courageous work. In Peter's case, he escapes death with some angelic help, and his faith and the church's faith is, is encouraged. The lesson that we can learn from this is that we all have different gifts. We all have different assignments. We all have different experiences, different successes, and divine intervention. It's partly a matter of gifts and calling, and it's partly a matter of where we fit into God's unfolding redemptive purpose. He has placed us in the day and the time in which we live. Let God be God. Let God be sovereign and glorify him in the life that you live, the lot that you find yourself in in this life, knowing that there is coming a day when he will deliver us from this fallen state. Now, we're going to get a little comic relief here in chapter 12 over these next few verses. We'll go ahead and pick up in verse 12. When he realized this, so Peter, again, finally comes to his senses. When he realizes this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. Now, remember, this group of praying believers, they're fervently praying. They're constantly praying. Peter shows up at this house, and he knocks on the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, so she didn't even see Peter, she just hears his voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she runs back inside. Now, Rhoda almost steals the attention here in chapter 12 because of the comical way that she responds. She just leaves. She leaves Peter right in the dooryard goes back inside. She almost steals the scene with her comic relief, almost like the king of England in uh, the, the, the show Hamilton. It goes on to say this. She goes inside, Rhoda goes inside and tells everyone, Peter's standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided, ah, it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continues knocking. Is anyone going to let me in? Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. They were shocked. They were bewildered. So here's a church fervently, constantly praying. God answers the prayer, and they didn't believe it. Rhoda, you're out of your mind. God, please save Peter. Peter's been saved. Nah, it must be his angel. 
fervently praying, constantly praying. God answers the prayers. They don't believe it. It's like, where, where is your faith? Where is your expectation of the prayers that you're praying? Were they praying with faith? Were they praying with expectation? It doesn't seem so. It doesn't appear to be. Or else they would have had a much different response to Rhoda when she comes and says, Peter's been saved. He's been delivered. And sometimes God answers prayer that is lacking in faith as a move of his sovereignty to perhaps grow our faith. Remember Pastor Kirk, uh, towards the beginning of this series, talked about how he was praying for two ladies in this church, and he didn't feel super faith in the moment. He didn't have great expectation of what was going to happen. He just prayed out of obedience to God and to his word. One lady was healed, the other lady wasn't. Same prayer, same level of faith. One's healed, the other isn't. So sometimes God answers prayer that's lacking in faith. Other times, he chooses to not answer prayer that's filled with faith as an act of his sovereignty. We're called and told by God to pray, to believe, to trust, to have faith, and leave the rest to him. Leave the fulfillment of prayer to God. Our responsibility is to pray. Leave the fulfillment up to him. Now, these four verses are so comical to me with how Rhoda responds and how the church responds. I heard a similar story, a similar account of a church in Kentucky. It's very reminiscent, reminiscent of this believing a group of Christians that are praying in Acts chapter 12. There was a small Kentucky town, and it, this town in Kentucky had one church, and it had one whiskey distillery in it. And the owner of the whiskey distillery was an atheist. Church members felt that the distillery had given the town a bad name, and so they often tried to get the place closed down, but to all no avail. Finally, they decided to pray for God to intervene. That same night, there was a terrible thunderstorm, and to the delight of the church members, the distillery was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. The next morning, the sermon was entitled, The Power of Prayer. Fire adjusters informed the distillery, the, the owner of the distillery, that they would not pay the claim as the fire was caused by an act of God, and it was not covered. Then the distillery owner sued the church, claiming that they had conspired with God to destroy his building. The church denied that they had done anything to cause such a fire. The trial judge observed, I find one thing about this case that is very perplexing to me. We have here a situation where the plaintiff, the plaintiff, an atheist is professing his belief in prayer and the power of God. And the defendant, the church, is denying the power of prayer. We should be people of faith that believe God can and that God will answer our prayers. And when he does answer them, let us not be surprised by that. Let's simply be thankful and give him praise. Amen? Let's continue here in verse 17. He motioned for them to be quiet. So Peter shows up, knocks on the door. They finally let him in, and he's trying to tell everyone, calm down, be quiet. He told them that the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. Now, this is obviously a different James than we read about back in verse 2 of this chapter. This is not James, the son of Zebedee. This is James, the brother of Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, Acts chapter 12 is a hinge chapter. There's, a, there's transition that takes place within this chapter. Up to this point, since the birth of the church back in Acts chapter 2, Peter has been the leader of the church in Jerusalem. 
And Peter is about to leave, and he knows that someone else is going to need to step into leadership as he was in. Though Peter doesn't come right out and say it, it seems that James is the captain now. James is the captain now. little Captain Phillips reference, in case you didn't get it. It appears that James has been emerging and is the obvious candidate for that role. Peter leaves and he goes to another place. And we don't know what that exact place is. We just know that he left and went somewhere else. And there's debate over why there's such ambiguity around that, that people were trying to keep Peter from getting tracked down again and imprisoned and killed, and they didn't want to uh, risk that happening. There are almost two incidental references here within what we've previously read that are worth taking just a few moments to discuss. The first one that I want to take note of is Peter's attitude and belief about the extraordinary angelic visitation. Now, we know from Scripture, Peter didn't think that this was reality. He, he thought he was having a vision. He thought that he was having a hallucination. And people sometimes uh, write or communicate that the early believers did not know the difference between reality and vision. And it doesn't seem like a big deal at face value, but the implications of that kind of belief are huge. It directly impacts the eyewitness accounts of the risen Christ after his crucifixion. Did those people actually see the risen Savior, or were they just having a vision, a vision and a hallucination? The answer is that we're able to distinguish between reality and vision perfectly fine. And we see that Peter was able to do that himself in this very passage. It's somewhat like, and, and I stress somewhat because it's not, a, it's not a closely connected example, but it's somewhat like when you have a vivid dream and you wake up and you think that what you dreamed about was reality. Has anyone ever had that happen to you? Right? Am I the only one? Okay, we got, a, we got some nodding and some hands here in the room. I, I remember I was in school, and I had a dream that my friend had spent the night. I woke up, and I'm walking around my room looking for my friend that never spent the night. And so after a little while of walking around your room and turning the lights on and investigating, you're able to make the connection, oh, it was just a dream. It's very similar to what Peter had just experienced. So we're able to see that the early church were able to fully, they were fully capable and aware of the difference between vision and reality. The second important element that I just want to take note of is that the believers were thinking that the voice that they heard was Peter's angel. What is Peter's angel? Was it similar to Charlie's? I, I don't, like, who, who is Peter's angel? Well, I, come ac I, I came across two predominant beliefs from theologians about who Peter's angel was. Some people believe that it was Peter's guardian angel. Now, many, the many uh, folks or theologians believe this, although I don't know that there is enough evidence within Scripture to support that. Um, and even for folks that will pull out vo uh, verses that they believe do support it, I don't see evidence that the folks living in those days believed that guardian angels would imitate voices of others. The other kind of predominant thought about who's Peter, who Peter's angel was was that they thought that Peter was killed in prison and his angel or his spirit was visiting them. And some theologians believe that. And I've heard uh, from multiple people that when their loved one dies, they're visited by that loved one in a dream to bring comfort to them. And even though some people may believe that, it's, a da it, it's dangerous to build that belief, that doctrine, on the inference of something that wasn't even true here in this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says this, Yes, we are fully confident and would rather be away from these earthly bodies for, when, for then we will be at home with the Lord. I always memorize this in the King James Version, which says this, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and present 
with the Lord. Now, we don't have any indication within Scripture of any kind of waiting period uh, or, or spirits floating around and visiting people. We do see instances where angels would show up and speak to people, but not mimicking them as a previous loved one. And remember that even with, with that in mind, we need to test the spirit because Satan himself at times appears as an angel of light. Remember, Paul said to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. Now, obviously, an angel from God would not preach a different kind of gospel, so it must be an inference about a demonic spirit in this instance. And mediums and seers would conjure up spirits of the dead to communicate and deliver a message from other people. And people still do that to this day. Because at times, people are told things that no one else would know. And they're led astray by deception and lies that come along with that. And it's a very, very dangerous thing, and we should not do it. You're opening yourself up to demonic influence when you do that. The only instance uh, that we see where this actually happens is in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 28. And we see that the medium or the seer's response in this instant was that she screamed, she shrieked, probably because she knew that as she was trying to conjure up Samuel, that typically the spirits that she contacted or interacted with were false or demonic, and somehow Samuel's appearance and interaction revealed to her that she was encountering a much greater power in that situation. Now, this is not justification by any means, to contact spirits of the dead or go to mediums or seer, seers. God gave crystal clear instruction that we should not do that. If you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. Exodus 22, verse 18. Oh, that's Old Testament. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Who is Peter's angel then that the believers were believing was at the door? We don't know, or we do know that it wasn't Peter's angel. It was, in fact, Peter. And I'll leave the answering to that previous question up to you. All right, we got to keep moving. Verse 18. At dawn, there was a great commotion amongst the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. And when he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea, left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. Now, under Roman law, if there were any guards that failed to keep prisoners in prison, if prisoners escaped on their watch, they were subject to the same um, penalty that the prisoners were. And so all 16 of those guards were killed. And it almost appears that Herod is sulking after this. It looks like Herod got a little salty. My dad likes to say that, that, you know, why are you being salty? Have you ever heard that phrase? Is that a Midwest thing? You've heard that here? Okay. Why are you salty? It, it looked like Herod is sulking. He leaves the area, goes down to Caesarea, and he never comes back. We're about to see that. Verse 20. Now, Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, so they sent a delegation to make peace with him, because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It's the voice of a god, not of a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. So Herod was trying to take out the leadership of the church. He killed James, and his plan was to move on to Peter after that. And it looked like Peter was going to die, but it in fact was Agrippa that himself died. 
Now, there, there's a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus that records and tells us that Herod would dress himself in beautiful silver robes intended to catch the light of the rising sun and make it appear that he himself was glowing and perhaps was some kind of supernatural being. Now, Luke doesn't go that far in his description of Herod Agrippa I, but we do know that from Luke's account, people were, that were listening to Herod praised him as, as being a god. And we don't see that um, anything other than the fact that he accepted that praise. Luke doesn't um, give us a whole lot of details with that, but we do know that God judges Agrippa and he dies from worms eating him alive. I remember when I prayed for my grandmother, she had this mechanical bed that was technically my great grandmother's, and uh, it was like jammed or something. We thought that it was broken, and my grandma was pretty bummed about it. So uh, she was like, I, I don't know if I brought it up or she did, but I prayed for God to uh, bring this bed back to life. And uh, I prayed, and almost instantly this thing starts working again. And I turned to my grandmother, and I'm like, Grandma, I, f I, I fixed your, your bed. And she said, no, don't say that. You might die from worms eating you alive if you take God's praise and his glory. And I was like, I don't want worms to eat me. <laughs> so uh, I was like, God did it, God did it. So it's, it's essentially this, what happened to Herod here. He accepted praise, being glorified as a God, and God judged him for it. Now, Luke brings this book to its midpoint. There are roughly about 12 years that pass so far from the beginning of the book until now, and the second half will cover roughly a slightly longer period of time. And so far, the church has been born in Acts chapter 2. Saul is converted to Christianity. Peter becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Persecution hits. God delivers them. James, the brother of Jesus, seemingly takes the position of authority within the church in Jerusalem that Peter had previously had. And now, moving on from this point, it's all things Paul from this point out in the book of Acts. Next week, we're going to be hearing about Paul, his first missionary journey, and all of that's about to shift to Paul. But here's what I want us to remember tonight. God is bigger than your you fill in the blank. God is bigger than your depression. God is bigger than your anxiety. God is bigger than your divorce. God is bigger than your medical report. He may intervene. He may not. But he's bigger than your problem. God is in control. Jesus is king. Did God fail James? No. James' death brought glory to God. James ran his race. He stood strong in his faith. He finished strong. He glorified God in his life, and he glorified God in his death. God is bigger than James' persecution. He's bigger than James' martyrdom. And God is bigger than your whatever it is that you're struggling with. God answered the prayer of the believers praying for Peter. God delivered Peter. He delivered the believers in Jerusalem from Agrippa I as he left saltily to Caesarea. The word of God spreads and there were many new believers. What better way to end a chapter than that? What better way to end a service than that? The believers are being persecuted their persecutor gets judged by God. They get delivered during Passover. The word of God spreads, and there were many new believers. Amen. I just want to end our service tonight by praying with you, by praying for you. Father, we come before you here this evening. I just want to thank you, Lord, that you are bigger than our problems and our issues that we face in this life. Whether you answer them or not, God, you still deserve the glory and the praise, and you are still good. And we worship you, Lord. And friend, maybe you're here tonight, and you don't know God as Father. 
I want you to know and I want you to hear. God is bigger than your sin. He's bigger than your mistakes. He's bigger than your shortcomings and he's bigger than your failures. And it's time to stop thinking that you're not good enough and to stop thinking that that God can't love you, that you're too far gone. It could not be further from the truth. He loves you just as you are. And I want to give you an opportunity right now that you can surrender not just your life, but your sin to him. And if you're ready to take that step of faith, to reach out to him, to call on his name, and to live your life differently, maybe it's time for a hinge-type moment in your life that some things need to change. If that's true for you, then pray with me right now. Say, Father, please forgive me for all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new. I believe you sent your son to die on a cross for my sin. And then he rose from the dead. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my closest friend. Help me to live for you, to love you, and obey you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Jay. He's going to lead us in our next steps real quick.